Hello, gentlemen. I don't know if I want to say good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, because we are recording from Caracas, from Paris, and from Sydney, Australia. And actually, we're in two different days. We are in Wednesday, and John is in Thursday. How's everything in the future, John? <laughs> yes, it's, uh, I can report that it's sunny and uh, the temperature is about 25 already and uh, uh, we have no bushfires and uh, everybody is wearing masks, but there is a kind of optimism, let's say. Oh, yeah. But not much different than 2020. <laughs> well, well, John is a professor of politics at the University of Sydney. Also, he's a professor at the Berlin Social Science Center in Germany. I don't know how to pronounce that it's the special name in, in German. Yeah, Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin, yeah. Well, that's, that's it. That's the German thing. He's a co-founder and director of Sydney Democracy Network. Also, he was a founder of the Center of the Study of Democracy in London. And he has written several books. And that's why I know you get to know you, John. I have this reflection of violence in Spanish. Oh. Oh. I also have this civil society and government of the world. Oh. I, don't know. I don't know if you have it the same name in, in, in English, but this is civil global society and government of the world. I really got, you know, this professor from Spain, Fenestra, I noticed that democracy, monetary democracy, you have written a lot about that. Mm -hmm. And this is the one that I like the most, Life and Death of Democracy. This particular book had a special trip from Sydney to Caracas, going through Mexico with a friend of mine. Yeah. I really enjoy it. Uh, John, thanks for, for the book. And right now you just had a new book called the new despotism, that's the one that we're going to talk. But before that, I want to also present Xavier Philippe. Xavier is a professor of public law uh, right now at the Université paris en Pantheon Sorbonne. But also he was a professor in Université de Aix-Marseille where we met. And he's a professor also in, well, director of the Institute of Constitutional Studies, Louis Favero, and director of this uh, master that I had the invitation to have a lecture there in reconstruction of the states, droit de la reconstruction d'état. And what I like, and he's especially invited because he has some idea of participation, um, power sharing, and conflict uh, justice, uh, trans transitional justice, and many and constitutional justice, and things that were really into it with this uh, opportunity that we're having this conversation. And near here from Caracas, Antonio Canova. Antonio, more than a professor, he's a friend of mine. I met him when, while he was my professor in uh, constitutional justice program. He has a PhD in uh, University Carlos III de Madrid. And right now at this moment, he's the founder of Experimental and Interdisciplinary Law Seminar because we believe that law can't be seen only from the judicial or juridic uh, uh, perspective, but we have to see several other matters and knowledge. And that's why he is here with us because I believe that he understands better these general ideas of what we're going to talk about. And now then to continue, I would like to give the word to John so he can talk a little bit about his new book and its contents. Uh, well, um, hola a todos. Uh... Uh, bonsoir, and um, I wanted to thank uh, especially uh, uh, muchas gracias por todo to Roberto, who I met uh, virtually. I have uh, never uh, before, we've never before been together. It's a great pleasure, uh, Roberto, and thank you very much for, 
for organizing uh, this small uh, seminar. It is, um, I hope, uh, not going to be a waste of your time. Uh, I want to try to uh, stimulate some discussion and I am expecting trouble uh, from, from, uh, from, from uh, my uh, critics uh, here. Um, yes, I do want to speak about the Little Green Book. Um, this is a, a small joke. I think it was Gaddafi who uh, published a Little Green Book. Uh, I have published another one. Um, and I want to uh, really lay on the table, so to say, let's say six points, key points that uh, might be helpful in coming to terms with this book, uh, making sense of it uh, and stimulating uh, some very good questions and tough questions. Of course, first point, every book uh, is a child of its time. Uh, it is somehow bound up with uh, the material developments of, of uh, the point in space and time in which it's, it's born. And uh, this book is uh, a book that contains quite a lot of um, my own thinking over many decades about power, um, about arbitrary power, um, and of course about uh, democracy. Um, it is also a book that I would say uh, reflects my own personal experiences and political experiences uh, over many years. Uh, for example, one example, um, you may not know that uh, in 2009 uh, uh, in Iran, where uh, quite a lot of my work uh, had been translated, uh, I was, there was a, a disputed election, let's say American style uh, a 2020 disputed election. And uh, there was a, a lot of public resistance. Uh, there were major uh, arrests uh, of journalists, intellectuals, uh, lawyers and others. Um, and at the opening trial, uh, of uh, those who were arrested, the leadership. Uh, I was named with Jürgen Habermas and Richard Rorty as three uh, of the conspirators of what they called uh, the Velvet Counter-Revolution. Uh, and uh, I was accused of being uh, an MI5, MI6 agent and CIA agent. Um, and then in the following days, there were major uh, press coverage of the three of us, including uh, rather scary details of, um, uh, of the meetings I had had in, uh, in Tehran and other cities and so on. Uh, that experience of being accused as a spy and till this day, not being able uh, to return to uh, Iran is, um, is, is one of those experiences that fed my thinking about uh, what I am calling the new despotism. This is a book um, that is a commentary on some of the big trends, global trends of our times. Uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the present day stagnation and uh, disorder, let's call it within the European uh, Union. Um, troubles in the Arab world, uh, a belligerent Russia, um, a self-confident China that is back and this time on a global uh, basis. And of course, uh, an American empire that looks to me, uh, this is a new subject on which I'm writing, it looks to me, if you think historically about the United States in the world, it's in decline as an empire. And there are many symptoms uh, of, of this. This book um, was uh, written and, um, uh, and completed uh, and published uh, before the great pestilence of 2020. And I uh, think that therefore we should um, talk at some point about uh, the implications of this book for making sense of this uh, great pestilence. So uh, this is the first point that this is a book that tries to make sense of a very major development of our time, uh, the birth of regimes of power, 
that seem to me to be different, that are marked by 21st century uh, characteristics, um, regimes that are more resilient than uh, many uh, outside observers suppose, uh, regimes that are threatening to power sharing constitutional uh, democracia monitorizada, um, and regimes of power. I'm speaking of Russia, I'm speaking of China, I'm speaking of Saudi, Vietnam, in Europe, Hungary. Um, regimes that are likely to be around for some time and therefore it is desirable, wise, to make good sense of them, to understand their dynamics uh, in order better that um, they can, so to say, be dealt with. This is the first uh, point. The second um, point I want to uh, put on the table and briefly to discuss is that this is a book about the language of concepts uh, through which we analyze the political. Um, it is a book uh, that is dissatisfied with much of the vocabulary for describing uh, these uh, regimes. Uh, for example, uh, among the, uh, we could say that there is uh, going on in our period, as happens in every great uh, crisis period, there is a struggle going on for uh, making sense of um, the world uh, through contestation of uh, languages. Um, and it's uh, an old rule uh, in, let's say, modern uh, crises that new terms are invented uh, or old ones are given new meaning. For instance, the French revolutionary dynamics uh, produce uh, a whole family of new terms, uh, imperialism, uh, Jacobinism, uh, for example, or uh, after Versailles uh, and in the early 1920s, words like corporatism, uh, words like fascism, totalitarianism are born of, of, of these uh, uh, major ruptures. And something similar, uh, I observe in this book, is going on at the present moment. And there uh, are competing terms to try to make sense of uh, these uh, despotisms. Uh, for instance, if you look at the book by uh, Masha Gessen on uh, Putin, you will see that um, uh, she uses uh, the key term autocracy. I do not think, uh, uh, strictly speaking, that these are uh, autocratic regimes. If by autocracy we mean um, a single ruler who is commanding of a whole state structure and its uh, subservient population. These are uh, uh, regimes, by contrast, in which um, patronage, patron-client relations, uh, what uh, Chinese um, uh, people call guangxi, connections, uh, blood is the Russian term, wasta is the Arabic uh, term. Uh, the system operates because of the interconnections, the um, back scratching, the, um, the clientelism. Uh, I guess it's clientelismo um, uh, in Espanol. I, I think um, this is, um, this is uh, clear. These are not tyrannies. Uh, if you mean by tyranny, as it was classically understood, uh, systems of rule through fear and chaos, uh, actually, they avoid the tyrant trap. Uh, and I'll try to illustrate that. These are not kleptocracies. Uh, Senator John McCain uh, famously uh, said that Putin's Russia was like a gas station masquerading as a state. You know, that, that it's a state that extracts resources from the population, steals uh, from them. Actually, these are systems um, in which there is much patronage and state expenditures and redistribution that goes on. 50% of the Russian population is directly dependent upon state uh, spending in one form or another. Um, these are not straightforward kleptocracies. I do not think, as I say in the book, in this attempt to clarify uh, language, 
to, uh, mm -hmm. to encourage readers to think about the importance of language and the concepts they carry. I do not think these are totalitarian or fascist regimes. If, again, we mean by totalitarianism uh, a form of rule based on total fear of mass mobilization and a coherent ideology, which is, so to say, compulsory, these regimes are not like this. And it's a misdescription um, of, uh, uh, of them to speak of them as uh, fascist or as totalitarian. Uh, that th th those words are common when speaking about China, for instance. I do not think uh, that these are crude capitalist uh, regimes. Uh, this is Branko Milanovic uh, in a new book um, who describes uh, Russia and China in this way. I think this is too simple. It's too one-dimensional. And I do not think that these are authoritarian regimes, and I would be very happy to have a discussion about both the genealogy of that uh, word. It is, um, it is a word invented by Juan Linz uh, and uh, popularized by Samuel Huntington. It is a word that carries uh, within it uh, strong connotations of rule through force. Uh, Actually, uh, these are regimes that are more complicated and sophisticated than uh, that. Um, and I do not think that phrases like hybrid regimes, which for me is a nonsense phrase, uh, I'm not sure what, um, what it specifies, uh, it's never clear in the literature, I do not think those words, um, that phrase is uh, useful. So. This is a long-winded way, uh, second point, of saying that it seems to me that there is um, an advantage to rethinking this cluster of terms. And it seems to me that one of the um, uh, 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 moves that can be made, what I try to do, is to resurrect, to reconstruct, uh, to redeploy a very old term, uh, despotism, that has its roots at least in the classical Greek world where the despotis was uh, the head of the household, the male head of the household. The despotis uh, was charged with the duty, the responsibility of, of caring for, and of course governing, um, uh, women and children and slaves within the household. It is a term that had then an extraordinary history, uh, for example, through Christian medieval uh, Europe. It is a term that had a long period of Orientalist uh, bias. So despotism was what was found in the Indian subcontinent or in Persia, in the Ottoman Empire in China, by contrast uh, with Europe. It is Montesquieu, as I say in the book, who began a process of rethinking uh, that uh, usage of the category. And more and more, uh, especially in the second half of the 18th century, the term uh, came to um, mean a form of rule over people, paradoxically, that manages to win the loyalty of the subjugated. That voluntary servitude uh, is um, a feature, a central uh, organizing feature of despotism. This is the sense in which, for example, Diderot, uh, the uh, co-founder of the Encyclopédie, uh, uses the term and uses it very powerfully. That understanding of uh, despotism I have tried to retrieve uh, to refine and to redeploy to make sense of these regimes. Third, um, uh, a point I wanted to mention, uh, to put on the table, so to say, is um, the advantages of, of this uh, uh, reconstructed understanding of, 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 of despotism. I think um, it's a, a term, uh, to repeat, that gets at the problem of um, voluntary servitude, 
uh, it gets at the problem of how it is that arbitrary power um, can actually win the loyalty of its subjects. How power can charm, uh, seduce, um, minimize violence, um, maximize manipulation in order to win sufficient loyalty, for example, among the middle classes. And in this sense, uh, put an end to democratic power sharing, uh, but nevertheless uh, continue to win um, the loyalty, uh, uh, the obedience of its subject population. I think there are other advantages of the category of despotism, and I wanted to mention uh, two. I think normatively speaking, um, it is uh, a much more ecumenical term than, for example, uh, authoritarianism, which uh, invented around 1970, always has been used until today as a concept pair. There is authoritarianism and there is, usually with an American accent, liberal democracy. Uh, these are concept pairs. Uh, so that liberal democracy American style is the normative standard by which uh, authoritarianism is judged. And as it was used uh, by uh, uh, Juan Lietz and uh, Samuel Huntington, the, the key decider is that in liberal democracy, there are free and fair elections in uh, authoritarianism, there are none. Uh, and this is not only a misdescription, but note that um, that category of authoritarianism supposes deeply that um, liberal democracy, American style, is the global standard by which uh, 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 regimes can be adjudged. I think, uh, and I try to say in the latter part of the book, that actually um, an advantage of the category of despotism is that it is more ecumenical. It is a, it is a term uh, that is critical of arbitrary power in all of its forms. Arbitrary power meaning power which is exercised over subjects uh, without public accountability, with a minimum of public accountability, uh, uh, where, um, uh, where manipulation and, uh, of course, force uh, is used uh, to exert the will of a ruling group over uh, others. Um, it is a term if I may put it in this way, normatively speaking, that Muslims, that, um, that Jews, uh, that um, Sufis, that Christians, Catholics, um, secularists can agree upon. Uh, it does not commit, uh, it does not commit uh, one, so to say, to an American idealized version of uh, liberal democracy and the presumption that, for example, um, the methodological individualism, the presumption that the individual should be the center of um, any uh, set of political norms. Um, India is not a liberal democracy. Taiwan is not a liberal democracy. And what I have tried to do in my work is to, uh, is to open up the category of democracy, but also here, uh, with the use of despotism, to say that it's possible to think about the problem of power normatively uh, without a commitment, so to say, to American ideals. I also think, finally, uh, about the advantages of this category. So um, it alerts us to the problem of voluntary servitude. Normatively speaking, it is more ecumenical. I think as well, as I try to show in the book, the category, uh, Tocqueville has a version of this, but it happened already in the agency. When the category is used, it is seen to be a form of rule on the same continuum as democracy, or to put it uh, differently, democracies are vulnerable, uh, specifically vulnerable to despotism. So the category alerts us to uh, the dangers 
that an actually existing democracy can degenerate into uh, despotism. One um, uh, point which uh, doesn't, uh, isn't well developed in the book, but which I have subsequently uh, tried to develop, is how uh, actually existing power sharing democracies can be transformed into a despotism. And um, I think uh, the category of despotism is very useful for uh, making sense of that fourth uh, point. Um, what kind of regimes am I talking about? What are their, their characteristics? Um, you will see uh, in the book, I hope there will be uh, a Spanish uh, translation, perhaps a French translation as well. Uh, you will see that this book concentrates on the genus rather than the species. I mean, I am interested in developing, so to say, an ideal type, uh, an ideal type, Max Weber, uh, to make sense of um, uh, many different uh, 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 regimes in practice, uh, to get at their common characteristics. I do not suppose that all dogs are Dalmatians, uh, that you know the earth is flat, but I do think at this point it is advantageous to actually look at um, qualities that they share in common. What do they share in common? What is uh, what are their uh, key features? A basic argument that runs through the book is that it is the recombinant qualities of these regimes that are the source of their durability. Uh, their ability, those who govern, their ability to draw together different elements that um, in, in an unusual combination that is the source of their uh, resilience. I'm aware, and I try to say um, uh, in the opening pages of this book, that when we uh, speak about despotisms, for example, Turkey, uh, for example, North Korea, uh, for example, uh, Central Asian republics, we are tempted to think of these regimes as, so to say, Alice in Wonderland regimes, you know, where there are uh, shouting sheep and flowers talk, very strange things, uh, bizarre things happen. For instance, um, um, uh, in uh, Belarus, uh, Lukashenko says, at the beginning of the pestilence, uh, what is the problem? I, I recommend uh, my fellow citizens to go to the sauna and to drink more vodka. This is the way that you deal with COVID-19. I mean, th th this is uh, seen to be somehow typical of the Alice in Wonderland quality. Or in the book, uh, I give the case of Kim Jong-un. Uh, you may not know that when Kim Jong-un travels, uh, outside uh, his country and within, uh, that his feces and urine are bagged and they are, they are protected by his secret service men uh, so that there cannot be any clinical testing uh, of, his, of his excrement. Why does he do this? Uh, because he's a paranoiac, uh, he does not want rumors about the state of his health, etc. So we have this impression of uh, despotism as chaotic, as Alice in Wonderland, as bizarre regimes. What I try to say in this book, in fact, is that their resilience is uh, very striking and that needs to be understood. Part of um, the recombinant quality of these regimes is that they have, um, every one of them, has some kind of built-in learning mechanisms. They try to be smart despotisms. For instance, um, all of them, with uh, one or two exceptions, practice elections. And elections are important mechanisms, early warning detector systems uh, for those who rule. They perform other functions, but they are an example of um, a learning mechanism. All of these regimes rely on think tanks, public opinion polling agencies. Um, I spent a day in Guangzhou preparing for this book 
speaking to the director of the oldest public opinion polling agency in China. And it's amazing how the Communist Party of China operates uh, by using uh, this very methodologically sophisticated uh, public opinion polling agency in order to, um, uh, to bring about reforms that they know are controversial. For example, introducing uh, traffic uh, controls, parking restrictions in a city of 40 million people. They know there will be public resistance, so they use the public opinion polling agency to uh, actively uh, scrutinize uh, uh, reactions. Um, there are other instances. The Singaporeans have been practicing since the 1980s uh, a program called the REACH program. This is an attempt to uh, keep an open dialogue with uh, stakeholders uh, in order to ensure that disloyalty does not flourish. Or uh, one uh, last example, you may not know, but in the Emirates, uh, they have a happiness program. Why not? Uh, so public happiness forums at all levels of the system to ask uh, <clears throat> the subjects uh, of this despotism uh, why they are not so happy. What is it that causes unhappiness in order that uh, they might be made uh, happier? All of these, I will very quickly uh, summarize this fourth point just to so to say, kangaroo hop through the key points. All of these regimes are regimes in which there's lots of talk of democracy, of the people, of the sovereign uh, people. Uh, they are phantom democracies, as I uh, call them. Um, all of them are regimes in which clientelism, I have mentioned this point, patronage is very important. This means everybody is entangled from top to bottom of the regime, everybody is entangled in webs of um, corrupting power. Uh, there is a wonderful Iranian film uh, by Mohammed uh, Rasulov called A Man of Integrity, which is uh, an account of corruption in contemporary Iran, where everybody, so to say, is soiled by some deal or some codependency upon uh, others uh, for getting a job, for getting permission uh, to travel, uh, to, uh, to build a country house, uh, to borrow money. All of this um, is, uh, these regimes are specialists, so to say, in a kind of vassalage, uh, a kind of clientelism. All of them have middle classes, some larger than others in China, at least 300 million people uh, describe themselves as middle class. Uh, this is uh, rising uh, fast. And what is striking is that these middle classes are typically loyal. They are quiet, they bellyache uh, behind closed doors, they, they make jokes, they satirize, you know, Putin and Xi and so on. But in practice, they do very little to oppose the regime. They are concerned with um, households. Uh, they are concerned with their careers. Uh, uh, and this is true for skilled and unskilled uh, labor. They also go shopping. Uh, I point out that under Erdogan, the number of shopping malls uh, uh, in his reign has increased by eight times. Um, you know, the encouragement of, of consumption is part of uh, these uh, regimes. They are not austere Soviet style um, economies that deny people um, uh, goods and services. All of them are plutocracies. It's a great paradox that uh, regimes, despotic regimes, are top down systems of power that where there is enormous concentration of wealth at the top, and yet the paradox is uh, they are regimes that can win the loyalty of significant parts of the population. Um, plutocracy uh, is uh, obvious um, in, in every case. In China, uh, you may know that in 2020, um, it now has the highest concentration of billionaires of any country on the face of the earth in 2020. 
over 270 billionaires, new billionaires were created. Uh, this is almost one a day. All of these uh, regimes rule through law. There is lots of reference to rule of law, uh, but they are regimes in which there is no functioning independent judiciary. Um, a juristocracy. This is a favorite term of uh, Edoyan. Uh, it is a word also used by uh, Viktor Orban. It is a word used in Poland to describe a court which is from the point of view of uh, peace out of control. The paradox is that these are regimes where there is constant reference to law and uh, where there is, so to say, a simulation of rule of law. Uh, in the book I give, as an example, the trial of Bo Xilai. He was the main competitor of Xi. The trial was without precedent. Uh, it looked in one way as a due process uh, trial uh, where all legal niceties were followed. Uh, of course, it was a foreordained uh, outcome that he would go to prison for the rest of uh, his life. All of these regimes are media saturated. Um, they are systems of censorship, to be sure. But they are also, as I try to des describe in the book, they are also regimes that, for example, use the internet to control the internet and use uh, digital networked uh, uh, communications to learn uh, where there are trouble spots. Um, this is a distinctive quality of uh, these regimes. The Iranians, the Chinese, the Russians are really uh, practicing state of the art um, uh, 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 media uh, strategies. Almost finally, all of these regimes are ones in which violence tends to be hidden away. Yes, there are disappearances. Yes, there, is, uh, there are cups of tea with censors and with uh, police. Um, and yes, there are murders. Uh, I give the examples uh, in the book of, um, of uh, Oleg Novoselsky um, and of course Jamal Khashoggi, um, Alexei Navalny, uh, the list goes on. Um, but what is striking is the way that violence comes stocking masked. There is a Singaporean uh, writer uh, taught me this phrase. There is, these are systems of calibrated coercion. There is targeted violence, but the bulk of the population does not feel uh, that they are the target of that violence. Uh, rather, the strategy is, it's an old uh, Chinese proverb, um, these regimes kill a monkey to scare the chickens. So you, you, you do select violence against particular individuals or a group and the word gets out and this, this um, is a, a warning signal that if you cause trouble, you too will suffer that fate. Um, I've mentioned uh, the welfare schemes uh, and uh, we can discuss those. I mentioned the case of Russia. China is another good example. If you think this is a brute capitalist uh, regime, then remember that it's a very unusual figure. Two thirds of, of GDP is actually recirculated through state structures. Uh, there is a very big expansion of tertiary education. There is a rolling out of uh, effectively a national health system, which is still very uneven to be sure. There are um, uh, pilot pension uh, uh, schemes for the population. And there is growing uh, 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 concern uh, in the Chinese Communist Party about uh, the aging of the population and how this will be uh, dealt with. Uh, almost finally, um, the book, uh, this is the fifth point, is a book that in one way encourages you to uh, do what is called gestalt switching. As you are reading it, 
perhaps halfway through, you begin to notice that many of the things that are being described and analyzed are going on in so named actually existing democracies. Uh, that is true for plutocracy. It's a curse on every actually existing democracy uh, with a couple of exceptions that uh, for 40 years, uh, the concentration of wealth at the top thoroughly inconsistent with democratic norms of equalization of power is going on. Um, these are um, these despotic qualities you can find, of course, in uh, we've just had four years of, I would say, despotic politics uh, from the White House. Uh, many of the qualities of the Trump uh, strategy, the gaslighting, um, the telling of lies, the bullshit, uh, the media strategies. Uh, uh, they have Russian, they have Iranian, they have Chinese qualities. Um, the development of, um, I would say, uh, the talk of the people, uh, the new populism, I mean, is a carrier of, I would say, despotic uh, politics. And of course, Though the book was published um, before uh, the pestilence or just as the pestilence was beginning to happen, I think it's striking that um, in many so named democracies, Chinese methods of uh, surveillance and control uh, to try to counter the pestilence um, are becoming the norm. Uh, and so the point that I want to make in this book is that. Um, democracies should fear despotism in no small measure because there are despotic trends at work inside actually existing uh, democracies. I would be very happy to uh, talk uh, through this. And finally, the book does raise the question of how those who value uh, democracy um, can best deal with these despotisms. Um, are we drifting, it asks, are we drifting into a new Cold War? Uh, there are plenty of Cold Warriors, for example, in Washington, we shall see what happens mm -hmm. in the Biden administration. Um, but picking a fight uh, with the leader of the pack, China, uh, is it an option? Uh, is it to be avoided? Um, and if so, um, how best to deal with China, which functions, I say in this book, as the equivalent of the Soviet Union uh, in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, it is the leader of the pack. It is the most powerful despotism. Its governing methods are describable in the terms that I uh, outline in this book. And it's, of course, um, in the process of becoming a global empire, uh, how shall we deal with it? Uh, how do Democrats deal with um, uh, this kind of despotism? Tariffs, trade embargoes, um, this is not uh, uh, clear. One uh, perhaps surprising recommendation that I make in this book is that a most powerful way of dealing with the problem of despotism is to clean up uh, what I call the Augean stables of democracy. That is improving the quality of democracy, um, uh, making more robust public accountability mechanisms, cleaning up elections, getting rid of dark money, dealing with the problem of um, plutocracy. I mean, these kinds of renovations, these kinds of renewals of the spirit of democracy are, uh, it seems to me, uh, the best weapon uh, for dealing with these despotisms. And one final uh, point um, in this uh, sixth um, uh, set of uh, remarks. The book raises the question of the structural weaknesses of these despotisms. Um, you have heard me say 
and to try to make the case that their recombinant qualities are um, a secret of their resilience. They strive to be learning despotisms. They are aware, those who govern are aware of the dangers of hubris, of the folly, um, the foolishness and stupidity of uh, decision-making when hubris grips uh, those who govern. Uh, but in this book, I make the suggestion that all things considered, it is the deficit of monetary democracy that is their greatest weakness. Um, you can, that means uh, not just only the absence of clean, fair, free and fair elections, but the shortages of independent public scrutiny of power wherever it is, ex uh, it is exercised. And a case in point, and I close on this, is COVID-19. Uh, I was um, uh, lucky to escape unscathed, but I was teaching summer school in Wuhan uh, in August, um, just a couple of months before the virus um, uh, erupted in that city and in that province of Hubei. Uh, and I followed very closely uh, the dynamics that took place from the end of December uh, 2019 and the early weeks of uh, 2020, you can see that this problem of the absence of independent, robust public accountability mechanisms, courts that monitor power, um, independent investigative journalism that is willing to speak against uh, corruption, you can see that dynamic at work in those early fateful weeks of 2020 when, as you know, for local reasons, the party uh, in and around, um, in that province, in and around Wuhan, clamps down on the medical profession. It tries to suppress uh, information about this new virus. And only later, um, around the third week of January, does it move. And we now know that had it moved it, very quickly, we probably would not have a global pestilence. So this is an example of a weakness, uh, despite all of the sources of resilience, a weakness, a fundamental weakness of these despotisms. And it is, a, I think, a key reason why democracy continues to be, normatively speaking, um, the most effective, powerful and attractive alternative to these despotisms of the 21st century. Muchas gracias, merci, merci beaucoup. Uh, I'm sorry I went on a bit longer, but, um, uh, uh, and I know that it's nearly bedtime for you, but, you know, I am awake and, um, and quite lively as you can tell. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, thank thank you. you. Thank you, John. And well, I was taking some notes here and uh, really interesting because trying to use a word, try to use a label for something that is new, it is, it is you know, being short of what we have to know about this uh, phenomenon. I like the idea of, you know, learning despotism. They're learning every day, smart despotism, and the idea of cleaning up democracy and has to be in permanent cleaning. And that's, that's a way of doing it is with permanent monitoring, monitoring. And uh, I want to, a couple of days ago, yesterday, I was talking with, with Xavier because he has uh, this activity next week about uh, savage constitutionalism. Uh, more or less, we talk about the same ideas. So I want Xavier to uh, have your, your, your presentation and make his remarks and what he thinks about it. And if he can use it for the next week activity and some of these uh, opinions. Did, did, you, did you say savage, savage constitutionalism? Yes, yes. yes. It's a, a, a way it's... to track people to come. Savage constitutionalism. It's a, how to transform constitutionalism in something that doesn't exist. 
but uh, keeping an eye on what is existing and transforming constitutionalism in you, times you, of COVID-19. This is, this is uh, sauvage, uh, this is Claude Lefort. Sauvage, yeah, as constitutionalism is sauvage. <laughs> I, I, I like this very much. I think that democracy has a sauvage uh, quality. It has a wild yeah. quality to it. Uh, and, and constitutionalism as well. Um, well, th th thank you, John, for your uh, inspiring uh, uh, comments on your, on, on your book. Uh, despotism is obviously something that, uh, a word that is known in France, um, but uh, um, I will make some, some remarks that are the, the, the words of a lawyer, nobody's perfect, not of a political scientist. And uh, I just want you know, to, to react on what you've said, because I think uh, uh, we share a lot of in common. I'm, I'm more as a lawyer looking at the toolbox that uh, this despot uh, use uh, to uh, promote the, the, the regime. Um, and I, I think that um, there are a number of uh, uh, discussion of doctrinal approach rejecting uh, 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 this idea of despotism. But uh, as you said, um, the word liberal democracy, in my opinion, is something that is wrong or something that does not uh, mean a lot. Uh, except maybe for those who have a certain idea of democracy, and maybe uh, the, 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 this despotism that you were uh, uh, scrutinizing in, 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 your, uh, in your speech uh, are, are not so, 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 so new than they seem. Um, a couple of reflections that can help after for the discussion. I think that you, you say that um, the um, despotist regime are clever in their means, but stupid in their goals. And this is maybe something that is uh, a trick. Uh, this is coming back to your sixth point, your final point when you say um, that they can be very stupid in making decisions, in, in final decision, because even good sense, uh, if it goes against their ideas, uh, will, uh, uh, do not, will not prevent them to, 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 to do it. But what is clear is that uh, when they want something, uh, uh, despotism is a way of managing power and keeping power. And well, I, I would like to get your, your, your opinion on that, but uh, the idea is not only to, to get into power, but also to keep it and to keep it for a long time, um, especially using um, uh, this clientelism, this uh, uh, so-called uh, basis uh, with the people uh, and identifying the, the ruler to the people, um, which is uh, something uh, uh, quite clever in, in terms of uh, uh, keeping the power, but you, you, you also need the tools uh, to do it. Um, w one thing that is also striking me when you speak about uh, all these regimes and you travel a lot around the world, I've seen, um, that a number of them are acting in completely bad faith. Uh, that is to say that they are capable to lie and to lie again to such an extent that basically uh, the lie became the truth. And <laughs> this is something really uh, astounding because uh, if you repeat something, even if it's not uh, uh, scientifically true, uh, uh, the, the people will start to, to say, yes, they're right. And uh, I, I will not jump into uh, all the elements you mentioned, but when you say they are using the internet to control the internet or to, to, to use their ideas or to promote their ideas to something which is not true, but using uh, these media, these new media, these social media uh, to promote their ideas is, is obviously for them, it's a piece of cake. Basically, um, they, they, they are able to, 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 to lie and to promote their ideas, despite the fact that, uh, and despite the fact that it's untrue and they know that they will not be controlled. So for them, it's, it's, it's something uh, 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 important. I must say that at the same time, uh, it, sorry, it's, it's a little bit disorganized, but I, I'm, I'm reacting to what you said. Um, they have a certain uh, empirical political sense. That is to say that they are able and this is something maybe if we compare with democracy, which can be maybe rethought or discussed, they are acting and reacting very quickly. Uh, 
even when doing nothing is a reaction. But they are able to, to tackle the issue quite quickly. And for the population, especially uh, I, 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 in established democracy, let's say, or cultural democracy, it takes ages to, to, to have a reaction. It's, well, we can take the example of this uh, uh, sanitary crisis where uh, you have several days, several weeks uh, before the government can react. They will react immediately, even if it's stupid, uh, but they react. And they give the sense of uh, feeling concerned by the questions and, and the people, and uh, it's also a way for them to, to, to keep an eye of, of, of what will be done. Uh, more structurally, and um, I, I, uh, I, I'm teaching a seminar on, on, on populism uh, uh, and, and all, well, on, on the European regimes that are uh, um, using the, the despotism as, as a means of uh, of control or, or, or power or using power. Uh, what is striking is that, and you mentioned it, uh, but this is true. If you start you know, digging into every legal element that, that is used by this regime, these despotic regimes, is the combination of actions altogether. They are not only a combination, but they are also coordination uh, sure. to reach the effect that is desired. And they are able to, to tackle one issue at each level. It could be from a legal point of view. It could be for an economic point of view. It could be for, uh, from, from a, a, a media point of view. Uh, they have this ability to react quickly and accurately using all the strings and putting all the string they have in their hands. And this is to me uh, something that, that, that is striking. I fully agree with you. We should not mix up everything. And authoritarian regime or fascist regimes are uh, uh, different regimes. All, all, all the classification you used are, are, are perfectly relevant. Maybe, and this is maybe a question I, I, I will I would love to, to, to have a discussion on. Uh, there are some different degrees. Uh, uh, if there is an identity of, of nature in the new despotism, there are some different degrees. And uh, these degrees can, can, are not necessarily uh, stated once and forever. Uh, for instance, I do believe that, uh, especially when uh, these rulers come into power with uh, despotic intentions, if I can say so, uh, they start to be and to play uh, quietly at the beginning, trying to respect the rule of law and saying, no, no, but don't worry, we are. Uh, people that listen to the, the, the to, to 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 their their voters, uh, so we will we will respect the rule of law, and progressively that they, they change and they increment progressively uh, their, their 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 power by uh, 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 using different elements. I, I can talk about them if you want later on, but uh, it, it's clear that they target the institutions. But for instance, they will never. Uh, 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 crash down one institution, a uh, constitutional institution. They will replace the people that are sitting within the institution and they will use uh, the, uh, the legal tools. That is to say, they will adopt new statutes and with the new statutes, they will replace the people with, w w their, by their people uh, in their institutions. So it, it is clear that uh, on that point of view, you spoke about the think tank, you spoke about the advisors, they pay a lot of attention to that, and um, they are able also. I don't know how much they pay them, but uh, they are able to hire people who uh, who, who do a, a very good job, I must say. And um, uh, there are some sometimes very, very it's stunning how they 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 can you know uh, start to build up uh, a, a, a legal construction or legal reasoning, and you say, well. You cannot say it's not made according to the rule of law, which is obviously uh, 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 tearing uh, uh, you apart. But uh, truly speaking, it's 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 uh, it's something uh, which is uh, 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 important. And uh, uh, what what also seems to me, you, you spoke about resilience, but uh, getting into power is something difficult. Uh, they usually use. Um, the, uh, especially when uh, a democracy is transforming into a despotic regime, they use the elections and they start by saying, you know, uh, democracy is not working. 
who is ruling the elites, you are not taken into consideration. Your voice is not heard. Elect us and we will do the job. And th they do it. And they are elected thanks to that. But once they are in power, they have also a, 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 an agenda, which is obviously to target the, 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 the elites and especially the elites that are uh, conflicting with them. Uh, they are also taking uh, a lot of attention to all kind of counterparts that can uh, prevent them to do what they want. So uh, firing judges, oh, they do not fire judges. They are much more clever. They put them on an early retirement. Uh, yeah. And in, in a couple of years, you can change the structures of the judiciary just using these tricks without firing one person, which is, uh, uh, well, from a legal point of view, you can say nothing, but uh, the efficiency is uh, 100%. So this is something which um, uh, we must take into consideration. And it's also a question I, I would like to, to engage with you, especially about the sixth point when you say, what can democracy do uh, against this despotism, this new despotism, once they have uh, cleverly, surely, slowly but surely changed all the rules, which, um, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit, you go one side, but you cannot come back. Uh, and uh, uh, they do it in a very, very clever manner. I must say that uh, the, the few examples are, I studied in Poland, Hungary, uh, are, 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 are especially, well, if you take one, one example that everybody knows, which is constitutional amendment, uh, because they, they, they are changing also the, the rules regarding, uh, not necessarily the elections, but the, 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 for instance, the, uh, the way in which uh, parliaments are elected. They move from proportional representation to majoritarian representation. And with 52%, they succeed to get 70% of the seats. And once they get 70 or 75% of the seats, they do what they want for constitutional amendment. Uh, you know, they, they don't have to ask anybody if uh, 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 um, they agree or disagree. They have a sufficient majority to, to do that. So um, doing that and changing uh, the, the, the complete structures without changing the institutions from an apparent uh, point of view is something uh, that is also to, 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 to be pointed out. And another question I would like to, 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 to mention, um, and you, you didn't mention it, well, directly in your speech, but um, uh, that interests me to, to know what they do about uh, the identity. Uh, because um, they, they, they use also uh, their identity, their national story, you know, to, um, to, to promote uh, uh, despotism. At, at one stage, you spoke about clientelism. How do you do clientelism? Well, basically, you have those who are convinced, those, okay. Then you have a, a bulk of people who are not necessarily convinced, but you have to convince. So you have to, 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 to give them a speech on which they can rely on or uh, on which they can recognize themselves in, in, in the ruler. And the national story, uh, the rebuilding of the national story uh, is something that seems to me uh, very interesting. So you also have a, a, a nationalism that is, uh, I'm not saying that despotic regimes are all playing with nationalists, but it, it's a common feature. And even if it's not pure nationalism, it's, it's the national culture. We, we the people, but not all the people are people. It's not we as all, but we as us. And th that's a difference, but it, it's, a, it's a wonderful way. You were speaking about Alice in Wonderland uh, to, 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 to get all the people who are not necessarily completely convinced to get them on board. And then obviously there is a third category of people you have to convince who are those who, are, who, are, who, are, who do not want, but you, you can buy them, you can bribe them. And corruption is also something that is uh, 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 largely used in, in these regimes, not necessarily for uh, uh, you know, this petty corruption uh, it's not for, for giving 50, 50 bucks 
to 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 a policeman to uh, on, on, on for, for a traffic offense it, it's 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 much much higher and it, it, they they have an ability an ability cap capacity uh, to control uh, not only um, the, the the legal system uh, the institution the political system but also the economic system and the media the media is actually something they pay a lot of attention to so put that all together uh, I think um, this is um, uh, uh, something uh, that is uh, uh, working quite well. Um, uh, my question about, uh, well, uh, you didn't specify it, but this is what I understood. Correct me if I'm wrong. But um, I had the impression that uh, despotism is not a theory, but rather justification uh, uh, that will help to uh, understand uh, how um, some uh, uh, exercise of power is made I I in a different manner. Um, it's, it's not necessarily new in the sense that uh, we have seen that uh, throughout history, but it, it works with a mixing of arguments. Th th this is a, a very ret rhetorical uh, arguments to justify uh, uh, the decisions that are made by 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 by, by a government or by by leaders, uh, I I agree as well. L let me um, uh, use a, another a movie example. Uh, you you were speaking about this Iranian uh, a, a movie, A Man of Integrity. Uh, <laughs> I also, when you were speaking, thought about uh, another movie, which is uh, The Godfather, uh, because yes. Uh, it's a patronage. It, it, it's a bunch of people. It, it's a family business. Uh, it's a large family. But um, it, it, even if it's a family business, it, in each family there is a godfather. Uh, he cannot do and he cannot run himself uh, the uh, the regime. But he, he is a key a key master. Um, what role you will you affect to to this godfather? Must he have a kind of charisma? And must he be a special person? Uh, well, I lived uh, for three years in Russia between two thousand four and two thousand seven um, under uh, uh, Vladimir Putin. Well, it was a, 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 a different a time, but uh, uh, he was already in power. When, when I'm looking uh, at, at China, uh, uh, to some extent uh, in Europe, Orban, uh, Erdogan, uh, Kaczynski, uh, th they are different people, but they have the capacity, you know, um, to, 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 to federate, to, 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 to join people, to, 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 to drag people together. I don't know if you've seen, for instance, this interview from uh, Vladimir Putin um, last year. Uh, it, it, I think it was in the Financial Times in New York when he explained what was democracy. <laughs> it's, no. it's a fantastic, fantastic interview. It's like, you know, his press conference at, at Christmas time, uh, no. where that's absolutely remarkable. No. You know? And it, it can justify anything. Um, but it's clear that the, the, the what is your view about you know maybe it's not in the book I'm 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 just you know uh, asking questions which are going behind maybe I ordered it but I did, didn't yet receive it um, uh, how the, the the charisma of of the leader uh, plays or not a role and does in your opinion something is something that uh, influence uh, the resilience of the regime. Uh, the question would be, uh, uh, would uh, somebody who has a charisma, uh, once he or she disappears, uh, be survived by, by his followers? I'm, I'm, well, I will not speak. Uh, I'm speaking in, in, with Roberto and, 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 and the situation in Venezuela. So uh, this is something that, that, that could be interesting uh, uh, also, also for me. Um, the, the 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 idea may be uh, also of gradual despotism is something that uh, um, that, that that could be um, interesting to 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 dig in. 
uh, it seems to me that there is a kind of sequencing uh, in despotism that uh, you, you, you have, it's also true in democracies. Uh, there is no reason why it shouldn't be uh, the same in, um, in, uh, uh, in, in despotic regimes. Uh, but uh, how do you do, 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 do you see that? Um, well, uh, I, I will maybe f a final point uh, on 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 a topic that interests me as a lawyer, as a, uh, rights and freedoms, well, fundamental rights and and, and freedoms, human rights. Um, it, it's also amazing uh, how the human rights are treated uh, in despotic regimes. In fact, they do not disappear. They do not disappear, but uh, they are split between uh, those rights that will actually promote uh, what you say. Well, it, it's more a question than a, a statement. Um, but it seems to me that uh, these rights that will promote the clientelism. I'm, I'm thinking here about something very, uh, very basic, like social economic rights. You help the people. Uh, you you get a pension scheme, uh, health uh, health care. Um, you support the the, the, the poor. Um, so social economic rights, uh, and it's not necessarily the case in democracy, are promoted. Meanwhile, political rights are obviously clearly and strictly controlled. If you speak about freedom of expression, for instance, uh, uh, well, freedom of expression is going down. You can express yourself, but not too much. Mm -hmm. And uh, th th there are limits and everybody knows. You can buy three TV sets, uh, two, i fi whatever you want, fine. But you don't touch two things that could uh, actually uh, jeopardize uh, the, 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 the regime. And on civil rights, um, it depends. Uh, because if you look, for instance, at a situation like Poland, um, if uh, some civil rights are uh, against the culture, against the, the national, the Christian identity, then uh, it's also something on which the park can jump on, the executive park can jump on. Uh, I'm thinking here about the case of um, uh, termination of pregnancy, abortion. Sure. Uh, in these countries, they, are, they can be very tough. On, 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 on such rights, provided that uh, it's part of their national identity. Um, I was in, in Poland a couple of years ago uh, when they, 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 they limited uh, and they wanted to, to, to stop the, 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 the abortion uh, rights uh, of women, including for, for, for medical reasons. And uh, well, the population um, did not really react. There was some kind of reaction but uh, uh, not enough and not even structured, not enough structured uh, to, to fight back a, a, against uh, 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 the destruction of, of some civil rights. So uh, rights and freedoms are also something on which um, these despotic regimes can, can be very tough. I, I'm not even speaking about the principle of equality because us mean the citizens and even uh, some citizens, but if you are foreigners in these countries, uh, well, uh, I think you, you are not necessarily welcome. Uh, or if you come with your, your, your bucks and if you are a tourist, uh, that's fine. But if you are a, an immigrant uh, coming from Syria in, in, in uh, Eastern Europe, I can tell you that it's, it's, it's very tough. Uh, and and you, you, you are denied your, your, your basic rights, including in the case of uh, a European country, uh, or an EU country uh, where normally uh, there is a, a fundamental, ch fundamental charter of human rights that, pr that protects you. So it's a little bit disorganized, but this is more, more or less what I, I wanted to say. Well, I, I should have said much more. Uh, maybe w w one last point, uh, because um, it's coming back to your final point. But it seems to me that w one of the, 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 the reasons why uh, these despotic regimes or, or this despotism it, it can, can be so resilient is that no opposition or structured opposition uh, can, can rise. Um, well, there will be usually a kind of small opposition that could be tolerated 
Uh, I mean, it's cosmetic, but uh, more or less, uh, okay, we need one, uh, provided that they don't go too far. But as far as uh, the civil society, for instance, or uh, these, uh, these groups uh, of, uh, of, of uh, civil society, CS organization or edit organization are trying to join and to, 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 to gather to, 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 to be an alternative, they are crashed down. So that, that, that seems to me uh, 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 something which is to, 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 to be considered. But thank you for your um, I, 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 your presentation. Uh, I think it's a, it's fascinating. I, I don't have any any kind of of, of critiques uh, on that. Yes, maybe a, a, another question I had while we were speaking um, is uh, it's it, it's going behind your your, your presentation, but uh, it also uh, has something to do with the question how we can. Uh, uh, prevent uh, these despotic regimes to 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 spread out uh, all around the world. Um, if you if you you consider that these regimes are um, enemy regimes from democracy, uh, how do we internationally cope with these regimes? Do we go uh, straight and say no, we cannot accept that, which is more or less the the, the EU strategy. Or with with Turkey, for instance, uh, or do we um, try uh, to engage or to continue to engage with uh, with, with these countries? Because uh, there, there is another phenomenon I noticed with uh, this uh, despotism or these despotic regimes is that they they start to 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 create a club, a new club of countries uh, gathering together. Uh, Brazil and the United States, Hungary, Russia, Poland. Um, who could have thought 20 years ago that uh, uh, the president of Hungary and the president of Russia would be the best friend in the world? So, and they are thinking about international collaboration, uh, exchange of programs, economic cooperation, so uh, yeah, th th you were speaking about a cold war or a, a new war, but yes, uh, I do believe that it's it, it, it's a risk. But thank you again. Well, uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Xavier. I I uh, I mean it's a, it's it's a sort of counter lecture to to mine and uh, with many. <laughs> Bridge points, uh, Roberto. I am in your hands as the the good coordinator chair. I mean, it, don't, I could... don't don't feel obliged to reply to all no, that's, the, that's, the idea and mention that came to my mind. Huh? Well, I, I I do have some comments. Uh, may I, or would you, um, Antonio? Well, or you would I don't like know. To... I, I, well, I would like that probably Antonio makes some questions, so you can refer it also in your in your comments. I don't know, Antonio, what do you think? Mm -hmm. oh, perfect. Well, my question is, is very short. Oh. <laughs> okay. uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting, uh, your vision, John, and, and, and even more that you have rescued this, this word, despotins. Uh, but my question is about uh, property rights, free market in relation to education. What is the, the relationship between these new despot, despot teams uh -huh. and the, the control that uh, this government have over the education of the children? Uh, 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 as you see, I, I, I think in these uh, despot teams, uh, there is a lot of indoctrination uh, always. So, so. All right, so John, bueno. you, can, you can answer this one to Antonio and then some remarks of the, the opinions of Xavier. And then I have a couple very short questions too. Sure, I'm looking forward to those. Well, uh, to Antonio, I, I think uh, I make a confession that in this book, 
uh, education uh, as a subject is uh, not uh, well treated. Uh, I am obviously aware of the point that you make and it's obviously uh, very important. I think that the role of universities uh, is, uh, you know, is, is an illustration of this point. Um, under despotic conditions, I speak of China, I speak of Russia, uh, I s do give the example in the book of Oman. Uh, universities are institutions where, as uh, Xavier has just uh, pointed out, you know, the exercise of political rights, I mean, public criticism of the regime is not tolerated. And if you try to organize a research group or a network, uh, or if you try to write um, counter editorials on media platforms, you will not last long. That is uh, very clearly uh, the dynamic. And so universities, tertiary education institutions are places where um, uh, face uh, facial recognition technology, artificial intelligence, robotics are encouraged. Um, uh, business management subjects. I mean, these vocationally linked subjects are critically important. Um, I would say the best developed example is Singapore. Um, it's not far from where I am at the moment. It, it's, it is in a way a model uh, despotism. Uh, it has all of the qualities that I just described, and it has also a very robust tertiary education system. But uh, mm -hmm. anybody who works uh, within th this uh, sector knows that there are electric fences, uh, as they say. You know, there are certain things that cannot be discussed, and there are certain actions that cannot be taken because you will be removed and you will not be you will not be removed by being arrested in the middle of the night with you know the secret police knocking on your door uh your contract will be um uh, shortened uh or you'll be redeployed into another institute where you're unhappy and eventually you know you leave the country uh, this is a typical uh, experience i think um the matter of um, property and uh, free markets is obviously linked. It is uh, a topic which I do discuss in the book. I think these are all species of state capitalist regimes. Uh, the state is a very important structuring actor uh, in determining uh, patterns of investment, uh, of production, uh, of the distribution of services and, of course, consumption. Um, uh, and uh, it's, these are systems where there is small trader markets, um, which are largely unproblematic for the regime. But when it comes to um, uh, uh, critical sectors uh, of, for example, communications technology, uh, or, uh, or financial platforms, banking and credit institutions, or, for example, uh, consumption uh, platforms like Alibaba in China. In each case, the state is a, a very powerful regulator. And this raises <clears throat> the uh, point which I, I didn't use, this Hungarian uh, uh, word of Hungarian uh, 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 invention polygarchy, polygarchs are um, typical of these regimes. So the political class is in business and the business class is in politics. Um, polygarchs uh, <laughs> was a, a, a term which Hungarian researchers uh, invented to describe the patterns of patronage at the top. Uh, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and it's an illustration of this uh, point about state uh, capitalism. Um, I think, I mean, muchas gracias, Antonio, for, the, for, for this remark. And what I have to say is not, uh, not, so, uh, not so interesting. It's uh, probably obvious. Uh, to uh, Xavier, 
Um, I mean, many, many points. I have uh, actually a whole page of, uh, <laughs> of, of remarks with a few asterisks. And I can't uh, deal with, um, uh, with all of these points. I have to say I'm very much in agreement. I think uh, our esprit is very much overlapping. And uh, I think we very well understand um, uh, these regimes and and the and the challenges they they pose. Many of your points, I think, are uh, illustrations or clarifications of things that I said but didn't say uh, so well. There are, however, I would say, um, a small handful of really important points that that you have raised, and I I should like to say just a few things, if I may, uh, about these. I think that, um, not in any order, I, I think that the relationship um, between the new populism, which has sprung up in practically every uh, actually existing democracy, the relationship between this new populism and its dynamics and these despotic regimes is of great interest uh, to me. Um, after the book was published, um, uh, actually before the book was published, I, we had here in Sydney a populism project uh, well before it became very sexy in the, in the human sciences. <laughs> we were doing it you know, seven or eight years ago. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so it seemed to me on the basis of the examples that you mentioned, uh, the Katinskis and the Orbans and uh, uh, Trump and and uh, the Bolsonaros and so on. It seems to me that, to put things very simply, um, in action, the populist style of politics, a protest against disaffection of millions of people who are pissed off with uh, the way democracies are functioning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That popular style that constantly refers to the people against an establishment um, that tries to win elections and when it gets its hands on um, uh, the uh, levers of governmental power, it begins necessarily, I would say, uh, to uh, it begins the process of the building of despotism. It does this as you correctly point out, by um, uh, in-grouping. It forms alliances, usually with rich and powerful groups, in order to secure its own um, political position within state institutions. It also outgroups. It picks on um, people who, to quote uh, Donald Trump's son, people who are not real people. So it depends on the context. It's Muslims, it's, it can be gays, it, 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 it can be um, uh, the marginal um, uh, Romani or what, whatever. It can be, it can be uh, uh, peddlers of disorder, the Hong Kongese, you know, in, uh, uh, in, in Chinese speak. Um, and typically in action on um, populism uh, tampers with rule of law. I mean, it weakens the independent status of the judiciary. And as you beautifully say, it uses a toolbox. Um, it replaces, um, it replaces uh, certain uh, judges. It mobilizes certain statutes. It may make constitutional amendments. Um, it um, encourages early retirement. Modi uh, is doing this and appointing uh, senior Supreme Court judges to the upper house of the of the mm -hmm. parliament, um, and a lot of rhetorical use of uh, uh, of references to law. That typically happens under populism. Um, it also weakens uh, public accountability mechanisms. It tries to um, uh, to weaken uh, the civil service. Uh, of course, it attacks uh, independent journalism. Um, Modi refers to um, uh, journalists he doesn't like as prostitutes. You know, this is a, a play on words. Uh, uh, and 
what is the, what, what is going on here? It is the will to the concentration of power in the name of the people and the weakening of democratic accountability mechanisms. So only after this book was published um, did I become um, much more deeply interested in the relationship between the new populism and um, the arts of building despotism. I have just finished mm -hmm. uh, with an Indian colleague. A book is coming out uh, in a few months on India, uh, which, which um, develops exactly this kind of analysis. And if I may put it, um, just to summarize this point, this first point about the very important um, interconnections between the new populism that has sprung up and um, potential despotic outcomes. Um, I would say that um, uh, uh, there were two uh, really important texts published just um, almost a century ago. Max Weber's uh, Politik mm -hmm. als Beruf, where he predicts that parliamentary democracies will be Führer Demokratie. This is a term that causes uh, some embarrassment in the German scene. So his prediction is that um, with the enfranchisement, with the universal franchise, democracies would tend uh, to produce parties and governments that would appeal to the people. And they would, they would uh, function as um, as oligarchies that could be removed by change of government, but that would be a permanent tendency in democracies. And in, that is in 1919, in the same year, there is um, actually a Barcelona-born Venezuelan, uh, Vaya, Vaya Lanz, uh, who published this book, um, which has, it's translated uh, en français, uh, there is no English translation, uh, on democratic Caesarism. And, and what he recommends uh, in 1919 is that now that this is the age of the people, uh, there is a problem of disorder and he's a kind of Hobbesian who wants, um, he, he wants um, a democratic Caesarism where there is a strong rulership uh, that daily in the name of the people governs and destroys uh, uh, sociedad civil. Uh, it destroys uh, independent uh, public accountability mechanisms, and it does so in the name of the people. That seems to me, uh, to put it uh, somehow uh, metaphorically, these two texts are needed to understand in these years of the 21st century how actually existing democracies can be destroyed. And one striking thing is um, that it takes, based on the Hungarian experience, it takes not much more than 10 years to effect mm -hmm. this transition. Mm -hmm. Building a power sharing rule of law, monetary democracy with a functioning civil society, as we know, uh, takes uh, many decades um, at the quickest. And in the older democracies, it took centuries uh, to do. The destruction of democracy in that mm -hmm. sense can happen very quickly and despotism mm -hmm. uh, can be built uh, uh, fast. Uh, this is clear from the Hungarian experience and it may well um, turn out to be a, a rule that applies even to the most powerful democracy uh, a fading democratic empire, the third democratic empire in the history of democracy, the United States. I think that um, we will see what happens, but uh, minimally what we have going in the United States, as you all know, we now have a major political party that commands at least 40% of uh, support that actually is uh, no longer uh, attached to the rules of republic of, of a republic and its power sharing mm -hmm. mechanisms mm -hmm. they are they are they are no longer a loyal opposition this is an achievement one achievement of the of the trump years so um th this is the the, the the first point that 
I think, uh, Sabia, that you very correctly put your finger on this problematic of, of how it is that democracies uh, can be transformed into despotisms, for example, using uh, elections. It is a very important uh, point. Um, a second uh, point that is uh, perhaps we disagree about uh, this, but it is the question of what you call identity. Uh, I didn't mention this um, in, uh, in my remarks, but it is a very important part of the book or its claim, which is the following. These despotisms are media saturated regimes. Um, they use uh, newspapers, radio, television, and digital platforms that are now interconnected. They use this um, uh, as uh, a major uh, set of tools for ruling. And they produce um, disinformation. Uh, there are lies that are spread. Um, technically, uh, there is in the sense of uh, Harry Frankfurt, bullshit. Bullshit is a kind of discourse that tries to set aside questions of veracity. Um, Gaslighting, or a few years ago it would have been called post-truth, is the norm. This is, a, this is what happens on a daily basis. I, I know from uh, delivering lectures on the post-truth discussion uh, in the West, uh, in China, when you give this talk, the audience, uh, so to say, rolls its eyes. I mean, it's like, <laughs> so, what's, so what's new? I mean, this is, this is what happens daily. We know that. Uh, so, you know, welcome to the world of China sort of thing. But uh, while I don't underestimate um, the national, the attraction of the national story, what I claim in this book is that these are not regimes uh, where a coherent uh, ideology is, is produced and uh, deployed that rather these are regimes whose rulers wear a coat of many colors. They mixed, the, they, the, the, the legitimation of rule has a kaleidoscopic quality and that makes them much trickier to deal with and much more uh, resilient. Uh, to put it differently, these are not regimes to be understood through George Orwell's 1984, or let's say Ray Bradbury's uh, Fahrenheit 451, which is uh, mm -hmm. you know, the picture of a regime where books are burned mm -hmm. and there is a compulsory um, ideology that is perpetrated. No, these are, these are regimes in which I give the example of Putin's, uh, you mentioned it, Xavier, uh, Putin's Christmas, you know, end of year uh, marathon uh, sometimes three hour long television performance, unscripted. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's like soap opera. Uh, there are many things in it um, that do not mm -hmm. cohere. Uh, he's father of the nation, he, is, he loves children, uh, he, he, he's asked which color he likes, he gives serious talk about uh, the importance of rule of law in China, uh, in Russia, uh, uh, economic growth. He, you know, he's an economist. He can do mm. all of it. Xi, Xi Jinping, um, in one day, I slightly condense this. In one day, he can give a major speech about ancient Chinese civilization. In the next hour, he can give a speech about socialism. In the next speech, he will give um, uh, 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 a defense of China as a higher form of democracy and will point to what is going on in the United States. In the next hour, uh, he will give um, a lecture on ecological civilization that could have been written by Greenpeace International. <laughs> and you put all of this together and it does not cohere. Uh, there's a kind of syncretism of the language. And here in the book, uh, I raise a critical question about Max Weber's thesis that every system of rule um, typically has uh, a single system of uh, legitimation. I think 
these are regimes very unusually that, um, uh, that multiply, uh, that have a kaleidoscope of, of languages through which they rule. That's true mm -hmm. for Edoyan. I think it is also true for Orban uh, and, and, uh, and so on. Um, there is a um, famous interview of Prime Minister Lee um, the current prime minister of Singapore, uh, where he says uh, in Singapore, and indeed in any uh, system of coherent effective rule, we no longer need ideologies. We mustn't have ideologies because ideologies are blinding. Uh, they, co they commit you to a particular pathway, so to say, of, of methods and of goals. And it is the syncretism of these regimes, I think, that is uh, very uh, it, it is 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 very striking. So they can uh, speak of human rights, but then in the next breath, it's social rights they are talking about. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so the um, so it goes on. About, if I may uh, say something about the Godfather. Yes. Uh, it is the case that uh, these despotisms um, are typically ruled by uh, a despot in chief. Uh, Nyatsov, um, Xi, Putin, um, MBS in Saudi Arabia, uh, and so on. Uh, and why is this? Uh, it is, of course, a way of fixing the meaning and uh, generating a certain attractiveness to the strong man. They are typically men. But it is also the political economy of it is that these are dynasties. These, are, these, are, these, are, these despotisms have a certain dynastic quality. Why? Because at the top, there is paranoia about um, trust and uh, fear that uh, the regime can be betrayed. Uh, and so um, these uh, dynasties are polygarchs. You know, there are sons and daughters and cousins who are um, big business people and who are, you know, heavily involved in, 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 uh, in governing strategies and so on. Uh, I describe in the book uh, the succession problem. There is a succession problem, therefore, you know, godfathers die. Uh, but what is striking is that these godfathers um, act as if they're immortal. Uh, and I, 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 I have a detailed, as it were, psychoanalysis in this book of, of, um, of that problem of, uh, of succession and of the great dangers of, of political death. It should, however, one last remark on this question of charisma. Uh, I think that uh, one shouldn't underestimate um, the quiet uh, despots. Um, I mentioned Prime Minister Lee. He has a Facebook following of over a million followers. Mm -hmm. he, he's not exactly, you know, um, sexy, bold, uh, kind of, you know, prone to make outrageous remarks. He's the quiet ruler. And uh, of course, he gets uh, quite a lot of his legitimacy from the fact uh, of his his father, the great founder of uh, current uh, uh, Singapore. Um, I wanted, uh, I think, two two other um, points, if I may, very much more quickly, on the question of tackling issues quickly. It's a really important point. You know how competent, uh, technically speaking, are these despotisms uh, at naming defining, um, strategically handling and solving problems. And you are right um, uh, uh, yeah, about uh, the unusual competence uh, of these regimes. I give in the book a number of examples. For instance, that um, the Shanghai banking crisis uh, in 2015 was solved uh, within several months by draconian intervention uh, by um, government uh, bureaucracy 
in the functioning of the Shanghai Stock Exchange, which, as you know, is striving to be a rival to London and Wall Street and Frankfurt. Uh, it couldn't have been done under open democratic conditions. Suspension of trading, arrest of certain corrupt officials, um, and uh, a general uh, halt to a major global stock exchange. Um, and I think that this COVID-19 pestilence is a test case. I mean, we are living through, um, we don't yet know what the final jury result will be, but we are living through a period where the competence of um, regimes led by China uh, at handling this pestilence is, I think, uh, at issue. My own view uh, is that the, uh, the thesis that democracies drag their feet, that they uh, twiddle their thumbs, that they delay and that there are uh, open public disagreements and, um, uh, and that with some luck, eventually they get around to solving the problem. This is a view of David Runciman, who is professor mm -hmm. at Cambridge. I think empirically, uh, this is questionable. Uh, and I think that, um, I think that in this uh, test case of, uh, of the COVID-19 pestilence, I have become very interested in five democracies uh, that seem to me to move very quickly um, and show that you can, you can handle this pestilence while preserving rule of law, uh, parliamentary government, and a civil society that is committed to the project of uh, reducing the virus and uh, an elimination of the virus. Taiwan, South Korea, New Zealand, Uruguay, and Australia. And I think that uh, what, is, what is striking about these um, power sharing democracies where the numbers of infections are comparatively very low uh, the number of deaths certainly very low. Not only did they move quickly, because they had early warning detectors built into them. Taiwan stopped all flights on December the 29th uh, because they were alert on the basis of previous uh, pestilences, SARS, uh, for example, swine uh, uh, flu. They were alert to the dangers. Each of these democracies gave a voice to medical expertise uh, where the, medic, the, the, the chief medical officers um, would say and still say, we uh, are sure about this, but we do not know this. So those medical officers played the role of um, bearers of the precautionary principle this is monetary democracy in action. And governments um, were therefore encouraged in these democracies to speak plainly. Don't lie, don't bullshit. Um, and the consequence in these five democracies is that the level of social trust in government uh, remained high until this point. And that's a hugely valuable resource for dealing with um, such matters as, you know, do you wear a mask and, and which public places uh, should be avoided and testing and tracing and so on. So um, this is just um, a verbose way. I'm sorry uh, for getting agitated about this, but to say that actually uh, the Runciman thesis seems to me to be <clears throat> uh, in need of amendment. And in this particular, historic moment, it does seem to me that the China model is not the only way of dealing uh, with mm -hmm. the pestilence. There is an alternative. The misfortune of Americans and, and British and Italians and Spanish, I would say, is that um, their democracies didn't function in this way. Uh, there was a democracy failure. It's a, an important phrase in, in, in my work, a democracy uh, failure. Finally, how, how do we cope with um, these uh, regimes? Uh, you are right, uh, Xavier, they hunt in packs. 
Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. They do oil and gas deals. They build pipelines. They exchange um, technology uh, 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 innovations. Uh, they do police and military training. Um, they sell weapons to one another, of course, often uh, with the help of so named uh, democracies. Um, and in this respect, uh, there is, it does seem to me, uh, reading the tea leaves of our times, it does seem to me that there is crystallizing um, something analogous to what happened uh, during the late 20s and 1930s. This is not a repetition of that period, but what we are, uh, so to say, um, as small d Democrats, if I could describe ourselves in this way, what we are facing is a form of power, which is a clear alternative. Um, and it has uh, multiple forms. It's not all cut from the same cloth. Um, I have no doubt that the leader of the pack is uh, China. Uh, and for this reason, I'm just about to publish um, a longish essay about the emergence of the new Chinese empire, what kind of empire it is. Empire is a dangerous word in China. You can't use it. Uh, it's said to be a bad word. It's what uh, China suffered for nearly two centuries. And you will find journalists and officials, uh, intellectuals, as I've discovered from many visits uh, there, uh, they will say, no, 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 we respect sovereign territoriality. Well, this is bullshit. Um, because <laughs> actually, if you do uh, a mapping of Chinese um, investment and, um, and diplomatic work and cultural activity, it is taking on the hallmarks of um, uh, all the hallmarks of an empire in the strict sense. Mm -hmm. It is a very large global power uh, that has spilled out well beyond its borders, and it is shaping um, uh, power relations in, uh, on every continent, including Antarctica. Uh, what kind of empire it is? Uh, well, it is a despotism. Uh, how uh, dumb is it? Actually, the thesis is that it's um, much smarter than you might imagine. Uh, and often does surprising things. For example, in 2018, uh, in Cambodia, uh, which is now really uh, a central part of the empire, uh, elections were scheduled. The European Union pulled out on the grounds that it's a totally corrupted uh, election under Hun Sen's rulership, despot in chief. The United States pulls funding. So guess who steps in to provide funding for the ballot boxes and the polling stations and the printing of materials? China. Uh, you know, Ch Ch China, China doesn't do national elections, but in, in Cambodia, it's support. And it did the same uh, in um, uh, 2019 in Myanmar, uh, the, the yeah, same Myanmar, yeah, no. mm. support for elections. So um, the question then, which is begged is, you know, how to deal with this China. Um, I would be very happy to send you this uh, long essay, which is to be published in a couple of weeks. Uh, to put it uh, too simply, it recommends against a Cold War, because uh, mm. I think no good can come from it. And it argues instead for an agile, smart, uh, foreign policies that can exploit the weaknesses of the Chinese empire, uh, negotiate where negotiations are possible for students, you know, exchange of students, why not? We have a material interest in this in universities uh, that can do trade deals. For instance, you may know it's big news in our region. I live in the China zone. Uh, that the RCEP, the world's largest trade deal, has just been signed by um, 16 countries. Uh, China was a great champion of this free trade deal, which is largely an Asia-Pacific deal. And guess who is not a member of, of this? 
the United States. It's a sign of the times. So Australia, South Korea, um, New Zealand mm -hmm. are all involved. And that. I am told that the negotiations were actually difficult, but um, in the end, agreeable. So, you know, there are compromises that uh, can be extracted from, uh, from uh, this Chinese despotism. Uh, there are uh, weaknesses in it, you know, the support for independent media platforms that, that monitor China, this can be uh, done. Um, and the question comes down then to the avoidance of, of military conflict. Uh, actually, in this essay, I point out that uh, this particular despotism uh, is practicing the art of um, defeating the United States by avoiding war. This is the, the Chinese military strategy and it, you can get very preoccupied with South China Sea and Taiwan. We will see what happens. But the Chinese military strategy, huge increase in the People's Liberation Army budget that has been going on for a decade. But the Chinese strategy is um, to uh, be tough uh, with the other big empire, um, but not, not to risk uh, let alone actually allow uh, an open military confrontation. This is a kind of clever strategy. And if that's mm -hmm. the case, then there are, you know, maneuverings against this empire. To repeat last sentence, the greatest weakness of this global empire is the, uh, is the shortage of um, monetary democracy institutions. It's, the, it's its great weakness. It cannot, it cannot openly admit to colonization in Xinjiang. Uh, it cannot admit to the failures of handling COVID-19. And mm -hmm. it will be forever dogged by this weakness. And it's a strength, it seems to me, that we have. This is not Cold War talk. Uh, it's different, but it is an advantage that we have mm -hmm. in that we like to practice, we preach, we like to practice um, public scrutiny of power because we know that power is a theme that runs through all my work and certainly through the power which is arbitrary is prone to foolishness, stupidity, hubris, getting things badly wrong and in extreme cases, great evils. That is, that is, that mm -hmm. is, that is, you know, a working uh, precept, it seems to me. Really, Roberto. Thank you. Really, really interesting. And you guys, you have no idea how I, I am enjoying this. And uh, let's see, let's see that we began. Well, what we time began... is it? What, what time is it in Caracas? Oh, let me tell you one thing. In one <laughs> minute, it will be Thursday to Xavier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. True, I'm worried, true. I'm, I'm worried, I'm worried, I'm worried, not about me. And I know Antonio, <laughs> his classes are also Magne uh, marvelous, but Xavier, I'm worried about you. How are, how are you feeling with this conversation? Uh, no, that's, uh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Well, I, 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 I'm into the conversation and thank you, John, for uh, making this, this comment. Uh, I think he, yeah, it enlightens a lot of uh, questions uh, uh, I, I had myself, uh, as raised myself and well, discussing with you, especially uh, from your, your your position and and your knowledge of China, it's it's quite quite fascinating, quite fascinating. Thank you. See, I have yeah. I have four questions. Yeah, I want I let me tell you one thing. I won't be here until Thursday. <laughs> mm. I'll remain until <laughs> Wednesday. All right. I have uh, four questions, small questions, of course, John. I want you I want you to answer it, but I also would like. Uh, some words from uh, Xavier. But before that, uh, considering what Antonio asked about education, I don't know if you have heard this book about uh, that wrote Michael Sandel that is called The Tyranny of Merits. No. New released, it is interesting. I haven't read it. I just saw the, the summary from Michael no. Sandel from Harvard. He's a philosopher of fellow in, in Harvard. No. Mm -hmm. Interesting because he talks about the, the idea of education and how universities right now are not the same that a couple of years or hundred years ago. 
The other thing is, and now I'm getting into the into the, the questions, are we have to recover the idea of democracy because as how um, uh, Michelangelo Overo mentioned it, the democracy is converting into something called elective autocracies. So you are oh. voting for people who then he thinks that they're entitled to govern our sovereignty, our personal sovereignty. Oh. And now we go to the four questions. I'm going to tell them the fourth so then you can, you know, make an exposition of all of them. Mm -hmm. First, how do we make opposition or resistance to this new despotism? It comes to my mind, I don't know, if you, have you heard this book, Hermano Vitale is defending, uh, like, uh, well, in, in Spanish is defenderse del poder por una resistencia constitucional. Constitutional resistance, Hermano Vitale. And, well, we were, you were talking about, well, we have no opposition or a very weak opposition or a created opposition. We see that opposition parties are not regular opposition, sometimes are picked by their own despotism to justify that they are living in democracies and they have opposition party and even they have some governors and stuff. That takes me to the second question, Venezuela. I know, John, that you have mentioned some studies about Venezuela in Life and Death of Democracy. I don't know if you have some uh, mentions in this new book. I have read, well, I haven't read the book yet, but I know that you mentioned specifically Syria, North Korea, and, now, and others, but you haven't mentioned in South America in general, but particularly Venezuela. I would like to know, you two, what do you think about the Venezuela situation? And how can, what level can we use to name Venezuela? Cool. The third one, and really important one, meanwhile, we're talking here, I have received, and I don't know it happened to you, the current situation in the United States mm -hmm. and what's going on at the, at, the, at the Congress, at the Congress building. The Congress, yeah. At, the scene, at, at this moment, we're talking, some Trump supporters got into the Congress building, something, something inimaginable for the United States. I know that John refers to Trump as the 40, uh, 45th. He doesn't mention his name, but <laughs> I would like some, some of your, your, your opinion of this. Yeah. And the other one, it will be the idea of technology. To have the monetary democracy, we have to rely on technology. And right now we have blockchain and we have elections and we have, but we see how the technology is being kidnapped by the, this despotism. How can we use technology? And how do you feel about this uh, blockchain and decentralized systems? Uh, that are not governed by the states. That's more or less, oh well, and uh, elections using blockchain technologies. I would like your general opinions about this and also, Xavier, for you. Xavier, mm -hmm. uh, would you like, uh, since it's now midnight, uh, would you like to go <laughs> first? <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, I, I, I could say, even though. I've, uh, I, I will be short on my answers and uh, it will need obviously much more time to fully respond yeah. to your questions. But how do we make resistance to, to, to despotism? Um, I would say that uh, the, the first question uh, that should be raised when you ask this question is, um, will you look at opposition parties, political parties, or will you look at the civil society? Um, usually in, in countries, uh, in despotic regimes are, or in populist regimes, uh, everything is made to crush down any opposition, or as I said earlier, to limit the opposition to something which is very cosmetic. So the question is, how do you organize uh, uh, the, this opposition? 
uh, the opposition can come from a, a lack of trust within the uh, despotic regime. And um, obviously in that case, it, it can come directly from the civil society um, in a disorganized manner. Um, it's, it's not impossible, but it has its limits because at one stage, if the opposition wants really to take over uh, the despotic regime, they will need some, some structure, there will be some kind of organization. And um, well, I, I would not compare, but uh, in France two years ago, we had the, the yellow jacket, the gilet jaune crisis, which is this very um, sudden uh, and coming from, from the ground uh, movement of the civil society, completely disorganized, which were, was claiming that uh, they, were, they, they had enough of uh, not being considered yeah. as people. And uh, it's interesting to see that, that once the movement itself uh, grew and grew up and grew up and grew up, uh, it disappeared simply because uh, there was a kind of an ability um, to, to get structured and to be a, a, a force that will oppose the, the, the power. We are, well, in a, in a democracy, even though uh, th there should be uh, many uh, comments to be made on, on, on that. But let's say that um, uh, I would say that in, in, in despotic regimes, uh, it should be even worse and even more difficult. So if you have an opposition, the, the question rather to know how do we make resistance is how do we structure uh, the opposition uh, to be able to, to, to resist and to be able to be successful, to be heard. The question with despotism and with uh, these, these, these regimes is, is um, the question of despotic regimes reversible to democracy? Can just by an election, uh, uh, can, can you come back uh, just by an election or using elections to democracy? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I'm not very optimistic on that. Well, maybe, maybe, uh, I don't know. Uh, if it has not been too long, or if people are really fed up uh, w w with the uh, uh, with the power, it, it can be it can be a problem. But but the question is st structural. St I don't know if, if if John has a different opinion or a different explanation. But 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 on that, uh, I would say that it's. Do uh... you want to go uh, one question by one question, uh, Roberto? As you feel better. I would like. I know, but, but uh, yeah, well, I think one, yeah. one by one because they're, they're quite different. Maybe yeah. with Venezuela, but ve with Venezuela, I would be very careful because, frankly speaking, I'm not in a position to give you lessons on what uh, should be done in, 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 in Venezuela, uh, despite my full support, you know, uh, to, to, to you and to, to the, 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 the work you did. Uh, uh, since uh, the, the, the beginning of the crisis and w w we support you since the beginning, as I told you many times. Uh, but uh, on, on that, I would say that uh, how to, to, to react to that, uh, I, I frankly don't know. And um, I am not uh, uh, in the mood of giving advice how to, to, to throw away <laughs> this particular regime. <laughs> um, but maybe you no. Know, um, if um, John wants to, to 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 react on the on the first second question, uh, yeah, gladly. I think um, ju just on Venezuela, Roberto I, and uh, Antonio, please forgive me because uh, you know I am equally going to disappoint. Uh, it's um, of course I have been following uh, as closely as I can uh, the catastrophe that you remain living through. Um, in the book, I do, not, uh, I do not speak of Venezuela as an established despotism. Uh, uh, and I think, however, uh, from the list of qualities that I mentioned, I mean, there, there, is, there are more than a few signs of, of that institutionally speaking, happening. But it is not yet a fact. Um, if I'm, maybe I'm mistaken, but you are not yet Vietnam or you are not yet um, uh, Russia. 
and uh, the very fact that we're engaged in a, what I call a digital mutiny. Here we are, you know, the four of us um, <laughs> having an open discussion uh, globally about matters of power and legitimacy and despotism and democracy. Uh, um, this would be very difficult to do in China and it will be very difficult to do in, 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 in Vietnam, for example. So I, 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 I intended this book to have um, a, a, a global resonance uh, because in no small measure, it's a book that is a warning uh, about uh, how despotism is built and how it can be durable. And it raises the key question of how that can be, how it can be defeated socially, politically, emotionally, let's say. And so um, that is, as I see, uh, you know, a small, a small gift, a modest gift uh, to, to your situation. And I'd like to hear much more about it. And we should correspond uh, much more about uh, the Venezuelan dynamic. About uh, your first question, um, uh, Roberto, about you know how how best, most effectively, to uh, oppose despotism. Um, at one point in the book, I say that there is really need for a new field of research called despotology. You know, despotology is the <laughs> is 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 the study of of the history of despotisms, of the language institutions, of how they're built and how they are dismantled, um, how best they are resisted. I, I think, um, uh, I, I think the, to this question, fundamental question, um, I think two things. I think, first of all, context really matters and it just depends on the specific context, you know, which which resistances uh, can be effective. Um, I do think, uh, secondly, however, that I think three things. I think, I think Savia is, is right. I think that resistance to despotism um, in matters of citizens and their representatives and uh, think tanks and, and universities and so on, I mean, in the resistance, there has to be an imagining of what will come after the Ancien Régime. Uh, and, you know, we, we have learned from, from revolutions uh, that Bastilles can be built uh, after they have been demolished. And therefore, uh, questions such as, you know, how will the judiciary be structured? What kind of electoral system um, are we demanding? What will be the role of universities? What about um, uh, the whole importance of uh, civil society? I mean, these are really fundamental, strategic and, and normative questions. I think it should be obvious. Um, the third and last point about this is um, that it does seem to me that there are some um, generic formulae, if I may put it like this, um, of how to go about it. I think that, you know, you would expect me to say this because um, I was involved in the discussion from the beginning uh, about trying to revive civil society. Um, you see a parallel between my attempt to revive the old category of despotism and um, the old language of civil society. In, uh, there is a piece coming out in Letras Libres uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, it's a kind of 40 year history of uh, the language and tactics of civil society globally. Well, it seems to me that one of the features of these despotisms is they seek to destroy civil society in the sense of the plurality of network interconnected organizations uh, that operate at a distance from, from state power and that are on bad terms with large corporations that are corrupted by state power. So the defense of civil society, um, depending on the context, but the defense of civil society is a basic, is a basic strategic weapon, it seems to me, uh, for uh, dealing with uh, despots and despotism builders and actually existing despotisms. 
as to what works uh, to repeat, um, it depends on the context. You know, I, however, think this is um, uh, an example of the of the greening of my political thinking. I I think that if you look at patterns of species destruction um, of uh, temperature changes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the chemicalization of uh, of food chains. Um, all of these despotisms are vulnerable to um, independent public monitoring and refusals of a further continuation of this environmental destruction. And I think um, it's very early days, but uh, just to, to uh, emphasize this point a little more, if you look uh, at interpretations of this COVID-19 pestilence and the drivers uh, of this pestilence and the sort of historic significance of this pestilence. And if you talk to um, epidemiologists, the leading epidemiologists, uh, I have been following uh, uh, a number of them for the past year, like Peter Piot. I think he's Belgian, he is head of the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And you listen to what they say, they say several things. First, um, this is surely not going to be the last uh, virus. Second, um, we haven't mapped um, the viruses that uh, probably exist on uh, our biosphere. We know probably only three or four percent of them. Uh, and we are busily engaged in trying to develop a taxonomy of them, but we don't know. Third, um, if this is not the last of viruses, what is it that's driving um, uh, 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 the planet virus or a virus planet, as uh, Piot calls it? Well, obviously, mobility, you know, globalization, movement of peoples. But here we come to the environmental point. Um, these epidemiologists are telling us, and they are examples of, you know, monitors, they're public monitors. Uh, they are contesting power. They're raising the precautionary principle. They're warning. They tell us that it is uh, deforestation, urbanization, suburbanization, that is a very critical uh, factor uh, uh, in the spread of viruses. Why? Because um, when you destroy forests, Piot tells us that around 70 football fields of forest are destroyed every day on our planet. Uh, you disturb uh, animals' habitats and patterns of movement. Animals are carrier of viruses. Many of them carry thousands of viruses. They come into contact with other animals that they would normally not. The virus spreads and those animals mm -hmm. displaced come in contact with humans. So um, the serious warning of the virologists, of these epidemiologists, is that we've got, you know, we've got an unsolved uh, problem and we're likely uh, to encounter experienced pestilences again and maybe even worse than this one. Um, and that kind of um, uh, consideration, it seems to me, is a very basic challenge for despotisms and as much, uh, as much for despotisms as, as it is for democracy. So this is a, a rather confused way of saying that um, context matters, uh, that uh, strategically civil society containing public monitors of power, independent public monitors of power is very important. Uh, building, protecting monitors within state institutions, uh, judiciaries that, that practice rule of law, for example. These are important. Um, and it may be that there are, however, some um, common uh, problematics that are uh, turn out to be the, the weak points of uh, these uh, so-called uh, new uh, despotisms. If you talk to the Taiwanese, 
they will, and you talk to the Taiwanese epidemiologists, they tell you that China is a, is a, is a disaster uh, for, for the world because uh, they now have, it's clear, a history of exporting viruses. Uh, they did with SARS um, uh, and they didn't, they were unhelpful in HIV, AIDS, uh, leprosy and so on. Why? Because the scrutiny, the public scrutiny mechanisms are too weak. Mm -hmm. So you need these. It's by the way, I stop on this. It's, it's by the way, um, a new argument for democracy. Uh, you know, in the history of democracy, there's been a repertoire of justifications. Uh, the Athenians um, uh, like to say in the poems and plays that democracy was good because it made uh, Athens militarily strong. Empire argument. This is very strange for our ears. Uh, or if you jump forward in time to the 19th century, you will find many Democrats who say that democracy is a God-given ideal. Uh, you typically find that it's Protestants who say that and not Catholics. It's very bad news for Catholics and Jains and Buddhists and Taoists <laughs> and, uh, and Hindus, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that in my work, what I have tried to develop in the last uh, several decades is, a, is a, in a way, implicit justification of democracy in its history, but now becomes of critical importance which is that democracy uh, understood as nothing less than free and fair elections, but something much more, mm. which is mm. the building of institutions that, uh, that, uh, that engage in public accountability uh, 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 processes. That the great thing about democracy, its key justification is that it is, um, it's a precautionary system. It, it builds in warnings to citizens and representatives uh, and all organizations of uh, what might be happening uh, with damaging consequences for people and the environments in which they dwell. Um, and that is uh, an argument, surprisingly, which is absent in the history of democracy. Uh, too much optimism about the future, too much belief in um, modernization and so on was part of its, uh, its history. I think in these years of the 21st century, um, this precautionary turn, uh, this um, public accountability argument, this um, um, very difficult to translate uh, into French, by the way, it's not surveillance. Uh, I don't know how you translate monetary democracy, but it, but it means it means the old, um, you may know, and I stop on this, um, the, it comes from the Latin, uh, monere, to warn, uh, so that, for example, in the medieval church in Europe, a monitory was a letter that someone would send to uh, someone placed high placed in the church, warning them not to pursue a course of action or praising them for doing the right thing. Uh, this old meaning of monitory, uh, of monitoring, I've tried to revive and to build in to uh, this category of democracy. Mm. Well, uh, again, uh, here, the idea is that democracy is uh, ethically and strategically more effective than despotic power in handling these kinds of new crises of, of the 21st uh, century. Uh, Roberto, you had a question about the United States? Yes. <laughs> yes. One, uh, uh, if I may, one or two sure. sentences. I think you can read the past four years of number 45's presidency uh, almost as a textbook um, story of how you build a despotism. Um, mm -hmm. You know, his assault on the federal bureaucracy, his dismantling of integrity units, uh, wherever he could 
in matters, say, of environmental protection, the systematic attack on independent journalism. I don't know if you listened in to the one hour um, telephone call uh, to the Attorney General of Georgia. It's not often mm -hmm. that despots are revealed at length. But at one point he says, uh, when the Attorney General or his assistant says, you know, but social media is, is um, you know, is not in agreement with you. Social media, he says, I am only interested in Trump media. Uh, we all know that you're biased, you know, big, big tech is against me. This is despotic thinking. Um, his constant references to the people, his manipulation of um, elections, his refusal to leave office. Um, he gave a speech in the last uh, 12 hours, uh, effectively calling on uh, protesters to come and disrupt, you know, the ratification of an election. Um, and, you know, this the concentration of wealth, growing gap between rich and poor, um, you know, all of this for me was a four year exercise in um, the transformation of a functioning rule of law democracy with a lot of imperfections into some kind of despotism. And I think every historian uh, would warn that um, the election of a new president is not going to change the trajectories easily. And we shall see uh, whether, uh, uh, how much can be changed. It looks like uh, now the Democrats have control of the Senate. That's quite an important, mm -hmm. that's quite an important achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, and it therefore means that, well, uh, some kind of um, uh, new Green Deal, which tries to breathe life back into the spirit and the functioning of democratic institutions, it's possible that we're going to see uh, movement in that direction but under very difficult circumstances, uh, a pestilence that's out of control, um, probably another recession uh, coming, um, and uh, probably 40% of the population uh, disaffected uh, with mm -hmm. the new presidency. This is a very dangerous dynamic. And when you add to this the geopolitics of it all, uh, I think, um, I mentioned this before, uh, there have only been several um, democratic empires in the history of democracy. This is the first global one. Uh, I think it's in decline. Uh, it's uh, dysfunctional in various parts of the world. Uh, its key weapon now is uh, military spending. It outspends uh, the next seven or eight countries combined, including China. Uh, its cultural uh, legitimacy is declining, uh, its political effectiveness uh, is in decline, and if you look at the economic criteria, um, the, the Chinese economy is outflanking uh, the American on uh, a number of really important fronts. Mm -hmm. If you go to China, one example, uh, your credit card, European credit card, or your, if you have a Venezuelan credit card. I don't know whether credit cards still function in Venezuela. They don't but, even uh, function here. Yeah. So if you go with a, a Visa or MasterCard, they don't function in China because they have an alternative payment system, which they've uh, put in place. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is, uh, it will very shortly be the world's largest economy, et cetera, et cetera. This is a, a shift of historic importance. So when you add the geopolitics to this equation, um, the empire is suffering badly, and uh, that has global implications. Um, technology is another question. How about another discussion uh, <laughs> uh, be, before midnight? Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, if I, I just may add something on, on, the, on the United States and uh, yeah. what happens this evening on the Congress, I think it's it's actually just a confirmation of what was what we discussed this evening that say how quick it can be to destroy democracy in less than four years uh, and what happened this evening is actually just a conclusion 
uh, unfortunately not the final one, uh, about uh, what uh, this textbook uh, uh, taught us for, for the, four, the, the four past years. Uh, because it, it, it's something uh, quite shocking. While you were, you, you were talking, I, I was uh, reading the, the, the head of the, of the news um, in, in, in newspapers, and wow, the, 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 the world is the worldwide is shock uh, by, 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 by what happened. It, could, could you think about uh, the invasion of the Congress uh, at the end of the? Uh, of, of the Trump presidency uh, four years ago? Probably not. So yes, the destruction of democracy can be very quick. I think it's an illustration of what, what we discussed this evening. Um, and uh, another illustration of what we discussed this evening, it's uh, once it's just been done, it's very difficult to come back to what is called normal. I think that uh, it's, not, it's, it, it's not just, you know, a period uh, uh, that uh, we will look later as, as something exceptional. It, 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 has, it will have a deep impact, uh, in my opinion, on, 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 the, on, on the global functioning of the American democracy. I hope, I hope it, they, they will recover. I think um, the United States is a democracy or has been seen as uh, for worldwide as a democracy as a model. Uh, but uh, what happened is, is really frightening to a certain extent. Yeah, uh, may, may I use this good Spanish word, um, uh, fracasomania. Um, so <laughs> here there is a, there is a, a, a I agree very much, Xavier, uh, but there is a, then, a, let's say, an attitudinal question about pessimism and optimism. And I, uh, in my writings, uh, about the history of democracy and thinking about the contemporary period. Uh, I, I, uh, I don't like catastrophism. You know, the belief that everything is going to the, to the dogs. This um, is uh, Albert Hirschman's, um, who was a Latin Americanist uh, term, fracasomania. You know, the belief that everything is shit, everything is kind of going downhill because uh, any actually existing context uh, usually has counter trends and it's important to pay attention to those counter trends. There is a whole industry at the moment of democracy crisis, of democracy decline or the end of democracy or how democracies die. Um, and no doubt empirically uh, uh, it speaks to our times. It is also important, however, I think to look for, for the counter trends as weak as they may be and to try to if you like, do Tocqueville in reverse, you know, to look at these counter trends, to think of the, uh, the way that they can actually be strengthened and might well be strengthening, even though the history which is under our noses is very difficult to judge, you know, its significance, I think. Um, and an example, I think, I think in the United States, I think the election overnight of, um, uh, this Baptist minister, Warnock, mm -hmm. who holds the, the pulpit or is in the church of Martin Luther King, it is of uh, much wider significance because th the way he became elected uh, in a state that was, for the last 20 years, Republican dominated, mm -hmm. is that it was built from below by civil society uh, with black, white, Latino alliances. Um, a victory for a kind of left politics, left in the sense of committed to renewing the spirit of democracy and you know, rule of law and uh, redistribution of wealth and life chances. It's a small victory, but it's a very significant victory and I suspect, you know, he is the first black senator from Georgia. Uh, he, but, but he is a carrier of this kind of democratic ethos. That is, I mean, it, it's like another world from that of number 45. And so you've got these counter trends going on uh, in the United States and uh, upon their success will depend, you know, the survival of the Republic, it seems to me. But yes, the situation is serious. But let us not let us not go to bed 
uh, <laughs> with, with, with fracasomania in, in, our, in, our, in our heads. Well, thank John, you. Antonio, Xavier, I'm really happy this, con this conversation got through. I'm sorry about uh, Xavier that you're supposed to be sleeping right now, no? Well, <laughs> yes, but uh, I will go in a few minutes. I right. promise. <laughs> But, no, no, it, was, it, it was a, a very interesting discussion and uh, obviously if we want to be together uh, th there is no other option than uh, doing that uh, and, and, and that's fine that's fine I will sleep one hour more tomorrow morning <laughs> and John you have a great day you have a great well I, I, I also want Thank to you, say uh, merci beaucoup and muchas gracias for the I think it, really it, excellent discussion I, I I learned a lot and um, and I think this is uh, we are zoom yes this is zoom at its best it's not quite the same as being in a room and feeling the ambience and smelling uh, and having food or wine or something but it's uh, it's been a very uh, important and and very stimulating session for me and I hope we can do it again. What and, Definitely. I, and you know, if, when all this ends, I hope soon, we have to go to this magical place called Aix-en-Provence, where uh, Xavier is professor there. And if you don't know it, uh, John, you have to go there for sure. No, I, I have been to Aix-en-Provence, please. <laughs> <laughs> Can you get us there now? <laughs> we shall make a commitment at least to, to, to do some or to lead us uh, some discussion or on another topic, obviously, in Sorbonne, in Paris. And uh, after we go to, to, to Aix-en-Provence, to Aix, uh, well, I still have my, uh, my place there. And uh, in, in summertime, it's beautiful. Right. Uh, so... Uh, this is a, a commitment we should make this evening, even though it's not for tomorrow. I'm in. I'm in. Okay. <laughs> I, I do. Antonio. Je suis d'accord. Je suis d'accord. Okay. okay. No. I say well, thank you all. Thank you. Um, I Bonsoir. wish you a good day, uh, a good night nice. for me, and a good evening for you in Caracas. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Best of luck in Caracas. Bye-bye.